fellow musicians. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank uh, Joaquin here for getting us all together for this, might as well call it, a workshop on song leading. And I hope to learn from you, and I'll pass on as much as I know, as I, much as I can. Uh, it just so happens that uh, this very year, I've decided if I never make another record again, I wanted to make a recording of what I know about song leading, and I uh, did a kind of a sing-along concert piece, which will be out uh, with Folkways later this year, which is specifically try and and uh, explore some of the different techniques I've learned over the years about song leading. Uh, consider this, that our ancestors once upon a time lived in tribes and villages, and they all sang together, really, whether it was North Europe or South Europe or Africa or where else. It was a common thing for villages and small groups of people to know the same songs. Maybe all the men sang the men's songs, the women sang the women's songs. And uh, in this modern life, things have gotten broken up. Some people sing in churches. Uh, summer camps will sing if they, when they get to know each other well. And I guess other organizations have this singing too. But I think uh, you and I face kind of a special situation in, in this period of history, late 20th century, of walking out on some kind of a platform or standing up in some kind of a room with a batch of other people who come from a whole lot of different places, a lot of different traditions, and we'd like them to sing together too, just like they did in the old days. And uh, how are we going to get them together? Uh, I, all my life, love to holler and make a racket and I'd sing Christmas carols with my friends and school songs. I sang the school chorus and glee club later on. Uh, but it was when I started making a living, started making a living of sorts, uh, traveling around with a banjo, that uh, people pointed out to me and I gradually realized that uh, well, I didn't have really much of a voice that I could get people singing with me. And that made up for a lot of lacks on my part. When they were all singing loud, they didn't care whether I could sing good or not. They were in, uh, the music that came out was pretty good. Usually I sing standing up. Now, Red Belly always sang sitting down and got a crowd singing with him. Josh White would put, his, put on a chair and he'd get a crowd singing with him. It was Josh, incidentally, who gave me the idea, taught me of uh, feeding out the lines between a song. He did it so expertly. On top of a whole stone, he all covered with snow. All covered with snow. I lost my true love. I lost my true love. The rock is so slow. The rock is so slow. Of course, you can do that with a jillion other songs. Sometimes it's easier than other times. Sometimes you have to really shoot out the words quick, and if you're a fraction of a second too late or too early, uh, it confuses things rather than helping. Uh, with a song, If I Had a Hammer, for example, uh, I don't have time to get the whole line. Uh, I'm, I'm singing at top speed with top energy, uh, and yet it does help the crowd, even though they theoretically know the song, it does help them if I just give them a little hint. <laughs> usually sing in the beginning of a concert, and uh, part of this workshop is going to be on how you can group songs. You want the flow uh, and continuity, at the same time you want variety. And uh, sometimes when you find yourself getting in a rut, 
uh, the best way to do is just make a violent switch, do a, something totally unexpected. Uh, I've given up planning songs too exactly in advance. I try to, but sometimes the improvised ones work better. And one reason they work better is that right in the middle of a concert, I think, oh, things are not going as well as they should. I've got to think in them. So while I'm th singing one song, I'm uh, trying to think of what can I do to get out of this rut. <laughs> I may sing a very slow song with no accompaniment. Uh, I may sing a, a funny song or a bawdy song or, some, or, for that matter, something very, very serious. But it, it, a switch, uh, something that was not expected. Uh, and maybe uh, my own success as a singer is more due to this uh, the fact that I've got a lot of songs in the back of my head, several hundred, and I can pull them out, uh, pull out the right song at the right time, because I really don't have much in the way of voice. I can sing, but uh, not what you call a good voice. I can play a guitar and banjo, but I'm not a, a great instrumentalist. Uh, but having this batch of songs in the back of my head that I can pull out a, a wide range of songs, and after all, no two audiences are alike, right? Should we sing for senior citizens or we can sing for little kids? We can sing for shy country people or blasé teenagers. <laughs> uh, and uh, so it, it's a big help to know a lot of different kinds of songs. Otherwise, well, no, if you want to stick to one particular type of audience, maybe uh, you're safe there. Like if you always sing for summer camps, you know the all the camp song. <laughs> John Jacob Jingle Irish <laughs> uh, And I suppose the same thing would go if you sang mostly for senior citizens. You sing mostly for senior citizens. You say, what kind of songs do you sing? Mm. Well, I usually hand out <clears throat> like percussion instruments and, uh, uh -huh. and do some up. Tempo things. Tambourines. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Well, wonderful. Ain't she sweet or. Uh, Old uh, pop songs. Yeah. Margie, I was just thinking of you, Margie. I bet they remember the days of the bouncing ball. Yeah. I don't mind reading words off a screen, and uh, from time to time I do it. Uh, I shoot words up on a screen or I uh, write out words on a big sheet of paper. Uh, but I really don't like everybody burying their nose in a sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. And when, when I'm coming to sing for some audience, and they say, well, let, me, let us know some of the songs you're going to sing. We'll mimeograph them, and we'll have everybody. I say, please don't. Uh, you can mimeograph them if you want to, but let's hand them out later on. Uh, don't hand them out while I'm singing. Because I, there's this kind of unity lost, I think, when everybody's got their nose buried in that piece of paper. First of all, you can't sing well this way. You sing much better with your with your head raised up. And of course, as any choral director knows, you sing best when you stand up. You fill a lung full of air, really sing out. Uh, but I've, I think I've started off this session, taught, and I'll continue on a little bit. Uh, have any of you had this experience that the choice of song can be crucial? I mean, here's, you might think a song would always be good, but somehow uh, it doesn't, didn't sound like it was supposed to. It didn't go over. And the reason was because it was in the wrong place. It, it, uh, maybe you had too many loud songs, and it was one more loud song. Or maybe it was, you'd had too many slow songs, and it was one more slow song. Or else uh, it didn't mean anything to the people. And in a sense, we're... We're not just singing, as you know, music. We're singing words. And uh, I feel the sometimes the, the words can be meaningless, uh, as in a lot of pop songs they are, granted. <laughs> I was trying to analyze some pop songs, and, and the more I thought of my, how stupid can you get? <laughs> uh, what was it, Disney? Well, Margie is a, is a typical. Uh, but uh, 
I confess that I came to this whole field feeling that uh, the world needs to be pulled together and musicians can help pull it together. Uh, one percent of the country owns one third of its wealth, and I'd like to unify the other 99% if I could. <laughs> the men and the women, and the gay and the straight, and the black and the white, and the young and the old, and the long hair and the crew cut. Uh, it's, uh, some people think I'm wrong about this. They say you're trying to unify too large a group. Cut it down to 80%. <laughs> 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 but uh, I, I, I find myself sticking with the 99%. And if I offend the other 1%, I don't really mind. But I don't like to offend people if I don't have to. On the other hand, I think often that I haven't done a good job if I haven't stretched uh, their imagination a little by singing something that they're not quite sure they agree with. <laughs> and uh, so this is part of it is singing a foreign language song occasionally. What do I want to sing in Spanish for? Only Spick speaks Spanish. Uh, but I feel very strongly that this country needs to be more bilingual. And I sing Spanish songs whenever, whenever I get a chance to. Guantanamera is, of course, one of the great ones. There's an awful lot more. Uh, but this feeling of continuity and uh, variety too is what I probably uh, was able to develop more than most people because I had a good memory. I guess a good memory does help. I can't remember a grocery list but I can remember songs, and I can't remember if I sit down and try and write them, but I stand up and start singing, and there's a memory in my tongue somewhere, a memory in my muscle or in my hands. It happened just the other day. I had to, I was going to sing Hard Rain Is Gonna Fall with a lot of words, and I said, Do I, I haven't sung this about six months. Do I know it really? And I said, you know, I don't. Well, i got to try it anyway. I'll fuck my, I remember the whole song once I got up there. 10,000 people were in front of me, and I, I would have been kind of embarrassed if I if I'd mucked it. But once I started singing, the muscle ca the muscle memory came out, and I remembered all the, the lines. Uh, so memory does help. Uh, and uh, some one of the questions uh, asked. Uh, does pitch help? Does rhythm help? All these things help. Let's take these up later on. But right now I'm talking about knowing a whole lot of different songs. Funny songs, bawdy songs, uh, angry songs, sad songs, and some songs which you sing solo. After all, uh, people would want to rest their vocal cords. Uh, and this is also why I play a uh, recorder sometimes to rest my own vocal cords and just play a tune on a whistle or play an instrumental on the, on the guitar. Uh, so you, do you have this, do you do this also, Tom? When, when, when you're, uh, if you're getting a whole crowd singing, do you find, uh, hold it back, let's rest our vocal cords for a while and play an instrumental or something? Well, I don't do that so much because I don't, as you said earlier, I don't consider myself to be that much of an instrumentalist. So I'd be, it'd be very embarrassing for me to try to <laughs> play an instrumental. Um, at, at the same time, what, what, what's fun sometimes is to, is to teach a chorus so well in the way that you're talking about that people can sing it back to me. I really enjoy that. And there's some rest in that sometimes. Harry Chapin does this. Uh, Harry Chapin has a song uh, of... The Cat's Cradle. Uh, uh, um, cats in the Cradle of the Tan Silver Spoon. It's a, a very serious song, if you don't know it, about uh, his wife wrote it, and it was aimed at him. And it's, uh, he wrote the tune for it because he recognized truth of it, about the father who was always busy and says to his kid wants to play, and he says, Oh, oh uh, uh, later, we'll get together. And uh, the chorus is from the old nursery rhyme. Cats in the cradle and silver spoon, the little boy blue and the man in the moon. And uh, after he sung two or three or four verses of it, 
even the people who never heard it before have learnt this chorus. And he'll ask the, the crowd to sing it back to him. And he'll just sit there listening. He'll play the accompaniment. So you do that too? Yeah, every now and then. I've, I've heard Tom Paxton do that several yeah. times with some of the old standards that yeah. he's done. He'll, he'll just say, now you sing it. Yeah. It's, re it's really fun. I Yeah. Well, it gives the audience a feeling of their own strength. I That's don't nice. do it so much, but in a sense I do, in that I stop singing on the song and just even the lines a little bit. Uh, Harry also does this with all my life's a circle, circle, sunrise and sundown, moon shines through the night time. It's a gentle, sentimental uh, song. And he said, let's hear the balcony sing it. And the, everybody listens to the balcony. <laughs> <laughs> he says, let's hear the front rows and the expensive seats sing it. Stand up and, around, <laughs> and uh, stand up and face backwards and sing the, the rest. Uh, he'll, uh, he'll say, hey, there's Mike out there been handling the sound system all over. Mike, you sing this. <laughs> and Mike, uh, without any microphone in front of me, he'll sing the, sing the chorus. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> sometimes the, the person handling the lights, come on out here, he gets out from the wings. And uh, He'll keep it going for not just two or three minutes, but four or five or six minutes. And this leads me to a something that I was slow to realize, is that sometimes when a song is only going half well, instead of stopping it, the best thing is to go on with it, because it'll get better and better. Bess Hawes had a guitar class she, she was teaching in a school, and the black man who was the maintenance man had was supposed to stay there to close up the joint. He liked coming and listen to them. He s says, stick with one song a long time. And he repeated that. That was his main contribution. And, and it's also one of the African traditions, that you stay with it till you really are with it. You don't get halfway and say, well, I guess it was a mistake and wander off halfway through. You. Uh, you stick with it until you get there. And uh, it may take five minutes, it may take 15 minutes. But if you've been to black churches, you'll know how they'll sing the, the whole thing. Odetta did this once when we were giving a, a Woody Guthrie program. We were singing, This Land is Your Land. She wouldn't let us stop it. She just kept singing it over and over. And every time I thought, well, this surely must be the last time. But she sang it again and again and again. And you, the audience rose to the occasion. They got better and better and better and better and better till they were on their feet and they were singing at their best. Far better than they were three minutes before when we would have normally ended the song. This is an African technique. It also was used in the, the play Hair, where they repeated that last line, let the sun shine, let the sun shine. That was originally just the last line of the song. The person who wrote the song never wrote that. It was the black performers who did this. And it's one more African tradition which uh, we white people are absorbing. Now, I've rattled on here for about 10 or 15 minutes, I guess, haven't I? Lenny used a lot of instrumental in his work. Well, I, I, I play some South American instruments, which I, I was using to both for the interest that they have. And I realized at one point I was doing a concert where the second half I was doing all my own songs and I was kind of feeling, I feel a little bit like Tom that my instrumental work isn't you now worth putting out there alone. But I realized that the, the charango in, in the first half gives people a break from words as well. They can just listen to the music and it's a rest. And I realized here I'm doing 12 songs. Solo on an instrument with a verse sung by one or two or three people with a whole crowd. Look what Bach did. He took, he write these wonderful fancy things in the organ and his choir would sing some harmony and then all of a sudden the whole congregation they said oh, we know this song and they all sang it uh, and every week he had a new one for him. the greatest period of music writing history it was the last years of his life when he just lived in the little city of Leipzig making up a uh, some fancy new arrangement for an old song so now the light's going off, and is the tape going off for a while, too? Is it not break? It break. Uh, 
Let me, uh, let's take a, sing a little song just for old time's sake because it was 34 years ago that a woman, 46 years old, uh, down in Los Angeles she was living. She met me and Earl Robinson and some others said, I'd like to try writing songs. And this was one of her first songs. I, I get butterflies in my stomach whenever I start to sing. When I'm out of microphone, I shake like anything. But if you sing along with me, I'll do my I'll right out loud. loud. I'm awful nervous, lonesome, but I'm swell when I'm around. Sing along, sing along, sing along, sing along. And just sing la 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 if you don't know the song. You'll find yourself a word Cause when we sing together We'll be heard You'll quickly learn the music You'll find yourself a word Cause when we sing together We'll be heard You'll quickly learn the music You'll find yourself a word Cause when we sing together Verses about my congressman's important, he hobnobs with big bills. Verses about unions, and as he ended, life is full of problems. The world's a funny place. I sometimes wonder why the hell I join the human race. If you sing along with me, I'll do my part like pretty. I'm awful nervous all of a sudden, but I make a swell committee. Sing along, sing along, sing along, sing along. And just say la 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 if you don't know the song. You'll quickly learn the music, you'll find yourself a word. Malvina Reynolds is involved. Okay, break. We shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved. Now, this is all right for a lullaby. We're going to sing it down that low. I purposely started the song in a very, very low key. Are we on? No, we're not even on. We're not even starting. Yeah, we're okay. I'll have to start all over again. <laughs> yeah. Give us the words, you know. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved. Like a tree that's planted by the wall. We shall not be moved. We two voices are exactly alike, but I rather guess that's a little bit low and comfortable a key. You could sing a lullaby in that key, nice and soft, or, but if you really want to sing out, it's hard to do it, at least for me, at that low key. So I usually, instead of singing in C like that, um, way up, just up in the D, up up here, way up. to get the song in the right pitch. And if you ever sang with a quartet, you can get in the fiercest arguments. Should it be in C or C sharp? No, it must. The weavers would argue for two hours about the key for the song. Because Ronnie is an alto, and what was a good key for her was a little bit too low for me. Uh, well, we 
I sometimes won, sometimes she won. Uh, but uh, you'll find as a song leader that the same song can sound very, very different. Uh, even what we just sang it in, I wouldn't consider real picket line key. If you want this song to sound out good, I mean good. <laughs> Now, this is going to be too high for some of the women, so you can sing the harmony. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved. Now, the, you have just a few notes above the, the men. We shall not, we shall not. So, now this is what I call a naked line. We shall not, we shall not be moved. singers love to do that. They sing low right down the middle of their register with a good strong alto voice, but they sing just three notes above to all the men. And you get nice two-part harmony. This is done in many folk choirs. Do you ever hear the Pietnitsky, the oh. chorus of Russia? Yeah. Uh, the women have the same uh, range of voice that the Carter family had, but they also did the same thing. They, women sang low and men sing high. And it's just one little thing that's a lot of fun to try sometimes with, with a crowd, to, to let them stretch their voices, let the men really push their men's voices as high as they can, instead of loafing around in the cellar, is raise it. And I'm quite, I rarely will start that song in that such a high key, I'd scare everybody away. Uh, they said, so oh, this is too high for me. I'm not going to sing out there. <laughs> Let him wear out his voice. <laughs> but I'll start it down low, and then I'll stop it and I raise it. And I raise it a little more. Raise it. And, and if it's really going well, they suddenly realize how much higher they can sing if, if they have to. Of course, you know what Beethoven did. He pushed things up to the absolute limit of the range when he did the Ode to Joy in E flat. And they, they sang. You wonder how they did it, but they did it. They're inspired. There's one choral director I knew in Canada, and she says, you're not out of breath, you're out of conviction. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but pitch is tremendously important. The right key for the right of every song. And the same song can sound so differently, low or high, uh, fortunately, I've got a kind of average voice. I don't have a particularly high tenor and I don't have a low bass. I wish many times I did have uh, a great range to my voice. I'd love to be able to sing one of those high tenors. Uh, and I'd love to, I'd even like even more to be a bass singer. Oh, I'd love to if I could sing a rich bass, but I can. My voice just kind of goes to a rumbly rumble when I try and sing low, it just vanishes. Has no. Uh, without a microphone, I couldn't be heard on a bass. Of course, I can fake it with a microphone, and you can too if you have a good microphone. You can uh, fake a, a low note. It's very soft, but you just move in close to the microphone. Like a... We shall not, we shall not move. We shall not, we shall not be moved. Now, nobody could hear that if I didn't have a microphone. But uh, with the microphone, it comes out, and it, and it adds to a good... I'd say bass singing is the thing we're still weakest on in this country. You go to Eastern Europe, where they have these big choruses, and you hear these wonderful, rich basses. Go to a, a church that's been singing together for generations, and got these <coughs> big basses. Oh, I'm envious. And... Uh, in our sing-alongs, we rarely, I would say, have enough basses. Do you ever hear enough basses? Yeah. We haven't built up a good tradition of bass singing yet. I, I'd say it's better than it used to be, and a lot of people who are singing Wima Wet with me have learned a little bit about bass singing, because the African choirs, the South African choirs, all depend on a rich bass. 
Uh, well, just for the fun of it, I'll teach you. All the men sings. Away, away, some Can you get that note? Away. Somebody else should sing. Some aquas on my yo way, yo way. Try that. Some aquas on my yo way, yo way. Try it again. Some aquas on my yo way, yo way. The song I learned out of a book given me by a wonderful South African woman, Mrs. Z.K. Matthews. She and her husband were in, living in exile in New York, and she said, Weemore is a good song, and we like the way you do it, but you should learn some of our other songs. And she gave me a whole book of, of these songs, and I tried learning a couple of them. And this is like a round. It goes over and over and over. It's an initiation for the young men. They're circumcised, and, and as they, the whole village stands around and sings this song, and there's a third part, so don't lose your place. Here we go. <laughs> minutes till we're really in it. It's a great round. Uh, I call it a round. It's not quite like the English rounds, but but uh, that bass, it's so wonderful to get a good rich bass, and I hope that maybe some of our songwriters will, will work on it. The gospel singers have done pretty good, but we, we need to do better. Two-part songs are fun. Uh, I've been having a lot of fun recently singing uh, Hole in the Bucket, just getting all the men to sing the men's part with me, and then I stay silent and let the women sing the women's verse. It's fun, the bouncing back and forth. But uh, I got me getting away from the subject because I really wanted to stick with pitch. Uh, here's where singing harmony is a big help. If the song's too high, you sing a low harmony. If the song's too low, sing a high harmony. And when you get a really good gang, it's inspiring to see the range of harmony you can get. Uh, some really high voices and some really low voices, and, and it's, it's a thrilling thing. At the same time, my gosh, there's times you don't want any harmony. Uh, here's a song I don't know if you ever heard. Matt McGinn wrote the words, and I just fitted it to an old tune. Here's a song for one and all. Down, a down, and down, a down. Here's a song for one and all. With a down, here's a song for one and all about a man just two foot tall. With a down, derry, 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 down, down. Now don't get any harmony, stay right on the melody. He met a dame on Blytheswood Square. Down, 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 down
met a dame on Blythswood Square. When a he met a dame on Blythswood Square, and she was forty fat and fair. When a down, merry, merry, merry down, she said to him with tender smile, down, 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 down. She said to him with a tender smile, oh, and and down, down. she said to him with tender smile, would you be free for a wee short while? Oh, and and down, merry, 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 down. Evil mind began to roam <laughs> down, 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 down. His evil mind began to roam with a His evil mind began to roam when she said, Dearie, come on home. With a down, dearie, 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 down, down. She showed him to her room and said, down, 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 down. She showed him to her room and said, well, She showed him to her room and said, Lay all your things upon that bed. With a down, dairy, 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 down, down. She said, I'll be right back in a tick. Down, 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 down. down, down, down. Said I'll be right back in a tick. There it down. She said I'll be right back in a tick. The wee man threw his clothes off quick. With a down, dairy, 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 down, down. She brought her seven children in. <laughs> down, 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 down. She brought her seven children in. With a Seven children in said, See that ruckle of bone and skin. Oh, in the down, dairy, 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 down, down, says she, destroying all his courage. Down, 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 down says she, destroying all his courage. Oh, in the down, says she, destroying all his courage. That's what you get when you don't eat porridge. <laughs> With a down, dairy, 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 down, down. <laughs> I, I learned that about a year or two ago, traveling up to, uh, to uh, met Matt McGinn's widow, said she'd found some poems and verses among his papers that had never been published, and that I ever seen it, no, I've never seen it. Well, Matt McGinn lives as we sing his songs. Uh, I brought that up because uh, harmony is wonderful. I love harmony, but some of the greatest singing is done with no harmony. American Indians don't use a lot of harmony. Don't use any, I don't think. And some of those Irish, Scottish type songs, you spoil them when you get harmony. I did a madu with a madu, I did a madu with a daddy, oh, I did a madu with a madu, the day we went to Rossio. Get Lou Killen to sing it for you. He, it's a long, humorous story about a bunch of soldiers that get drunk and, and they finally find a place to spend, get lodging for the night. And one of them sneezes and he wakes, wakes a half a million fleas. <laughs> and they're all singing, do them a do with them a day, do them a do with daddy, oh, do them a do with them a day, the day we went to Rossi, oh. And you spoil it if you go to harmony. There's some songs too you spoil if you get more than two parts. Uh, again, listen to some of the uh, songs of the Pietnitsky Chorus, two women's voices, and you don't want three parts. You don't want three or four parts, just those two parts. Uh, they're so nice and stand out so clear. We were singing a little while ago the, uh, the uh, Mexican, no, it's a Cuban song actually. Even if you never, if you don't know the words, you can la la your way through. Se quiere te verás con lo 
Traditions are full of these two part songs, Mediterranean traditions especially, which are, of course, throughout Latin America. And uh, I think it's worth respecting these traditions, uh, not messing them up, trying to put harmony to the songs that don't, weren't originally intended to have harmony, uh, not trying to put four part harmony to something that was intended to have two part harmony. Uh, on the other hand, you can be disrespectful sometimes and make a breakthrough. Lots of great musicians have. Uh, but uh, is there anything else I haven't said about pitch? I, I think it's worthwhile, uh, if you get a crowd that likes to sing, to stretch their range a little bit, sing some songs real high. Uh, the song I've Got six, Sixpence, which soldiers used to sing, is one of these songs. Uh, you know, uh, sung that so much in 40 years, but <laughs> that high note, happy ah, yesterday. It's worthwhile reaching for a high note occasionally. It's what tenors love to do. And uh, so sometimes when I sing uh, that song, the Homestead Strike song, I may sing it tonight over at uh, Berkeley. It, you just, it's already high in pitch. And then you say, any tenors around? Oh, they have a fine time reaching for the high notes. And they're proud they sing notes nobody else can sing. Uh, what else about pitch, though? Because it helps beyond pitch. And uh, 
when you're nervous, when you're straining, you can get out of pitch. If you're not listening to myself, often I might say also one of the first signs of senility is you start getting out of pitch too. <laughs> I can no longer tune a banjo or a guitar if it's noisy around me. I just can't hear it. And uh, I now get the guitar well tuned off stage and bring it on because I don't like to take too long to tune it. I can tune a banjo fairly quickly still, but, uh, but I no longer got my land. My mother, age 89, could still hear good pitches. She said, I'm sure. She was a violin teacher. She'd, all her life she told people when they're off pitch, and she was telling me I was off pitch till the day she was dying. <laughs> Anything else we haven't taken on about pitch? Well, what about some of us that are young? I mean, on stage I'm trying to figure out a harmony to remember one and I hit the wrong note. Is there any tips to help you not do that? I mean, well, there's <laughs> nothing wrong with a wrong note, really. Sometimes it might surprise you by being a right note. <laughs> you think of all the jazz musicians who just are having a fine time, they're hitting wrong notes all over the place. <laughs> People think they're right. <laughs> Think of all the cooks who sprinkled too much of something in the soup and it turned out great. Uh, no, if you hit a wrong note, you just laugh about it and go on. Uh, admittedly, it's a big help to have confidence. And uh, I was helped all my life in that I had a low threshold of nervousness. Uh, I can get nervous talking to one person, but I don't get nervous talking to large groups of people. I, uh, and I'd sung all my life with friends, and so it wasn't anything particular to walk out on the stage. And uh, I, so it, I guess there's no uh, substitute for doing it a, a lot. You know, you, uh, if you're nervous about something, try it. Do it again. Do it again until you get over your nervousness. Are any other recommendations for getting over nervousness? Because you know nerve. Real well. Yeah, I know. <laughs> As the song says, I know my song well before I start singing. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing it seems to me about about nervousness too is I get more nervous when I feel as though I have to carry the whole show. And when you start talking about involving other people in it, it really to me helps. it's a real. Yeah. You know, you, you, just to trust the fact that they're going to give back a whole lot, and that that's the biggest help to yeah. me in, in performing or in, in getting them to sing along or anything. Yeah. Of course, about singing on pitch, which I'll end off this little section, it does help sometimes to have a monitor uh, speaker. Mm -hmm. I don't like them because I can't hear the audience so well, and I want to be able to tell how well they're singing. But if I want to hear myself know that I'm singing on pitch, one of these little monitor speakers, this is why Paul Robeson used to sing with his, with his uh, hand like this, and Ewan McCall does also. Carries the voice right up the palm right into your ear, and you can stay on pitch much better if you do that. If he sings a cappella, which we just heard him, and that's why he does that, yep. I was curious. That's that. right, and when you're singing a long ballad, your voice is your main, your only instrument, and he's, he wants to know exactly what his voice is doing, and he can hear it better when he does this. He doesn't cover up his ear. The voice, the sound is going from his lips to the palm and then up his fingers to his ear. I have a question about pitch. Yeah. Um, every now and then I have the experience with an audience that uh, I can't get one of the parts on the right pitch. Are there any specific techniques to actually helping people get to where you want to begin? Well, here's one instrument could help. You can sing one pitch and the instrument take the other. Uh, that helps a little bit. And sometimes you can bob around with your own voice, but it may end up by confusing people. Yeah, sometimes yeah. you sing first the high part, and then you sing the low part. People don't yeah. know who to. You lose somebody. And yeah. I swear, the way to, you know. No, I don't know exactly what to do. Here's where, of course, people like to divide up the audience. You all sing the low part. You all sing the high. But this can get kind of mechanical sometimes, and I have given it up in recent years unless I have to do it because it. Uh, if you get too teachy about things. Uh, sometimes you can destroy the flow of the evening. You're so busy teaching. And uh, yet occasionally uh, it's worthwhile trying to teach some things. I've been, do we have time on the, on the tape to teach another song to you all here? I, uh, I learned last fall, I went to sing out, said, do you know any 
any Nicaraguan songs. And uh, Sarah Plant, the new editor of Sing Out, the music, new music editors, the big smile says, just so happens this issue, we've got a fine Nicaraguan song. And it is a beauty. <laughs> Cristo ya nació en Palacaguina, el chefe favor y una tal María, que a la pancha, muy humildemente, la ropa perosa, la ropa perosa del terrateniente. And I usually get a laugh when I say, you know, I'm going to teach that all to you. <laughs> but it is not as hard because I put out words. <laughs> I even wrote my piece, piece of plywood about ten feet high. Cristo ya nació en Palacatrina doesn't know Spanish, you know, you don't pronounce the H, and you roll the R's, and the J is an H. <laughs> La ropa que goza la mujer rociosa del terrateniente. Try a little faster. They actually sing it very fast in Nicaragua. Cristo nació but I'll tell you what the words mean. Christ is already born in Palacaguina of Joe Pavone and that gal Maria. She's the one that goes so humbly to iron clothes for the lazy wife of the landlord. And then the verses. That's Se vi una resplanta la strana, come una aurora de medianoche. Los maes a la sembra indiera, los libra plata se estrena siena. Io vi ho los porno e agalpa, porte il peneca e por chichi galpa. Cristo ya nació. There was a strange splendor like a midnight dawn. It lit up the corn plants. Bolts of lightning shivered a shower of light. Over Moya Galpa, Telpaneca, Chichi Galpa. Christ is already born here in Palacaguina. The second verse says, The Indians gathered round. The Indians is the word for the poor people, the farmers, to watch this and Joaquin brought bread and cheese from Nagarote. There was no gold, no incense, but there was sweets from Duriomo and little fried donuts from Guadalupe. Cristo ya nació en Palacarina del Chile. Sing 
Mejia Godoy, a wonderful young composer who was exiled by Samosa. And this was one of the reasons why he said, What's wrong with this song? <laughs> well, those of you who know Spanish, Maria, sueña que el hijo, igual que el trata sea carpintero. Pero el simpatio piensa, mañana quiero ser guerrero. Cristo ya nació. from the dust in the carpentry shop. Maria, she's dreaming that her boy is going to be a carpenter like his daddy. The kid is thinking, tomorrow I want to be a gorilla puppet. <laughs> Musicians call a hemiola, that is two beats against three, all in one. So the foot is going to be one, two, three, one, two, three, but the guitar is going. time, maybe 10 minutes or more, to teach to a crowd, but it's worth it, maybe once in the evening to take the time for it. And you get a lot of satisfaction saying, you know, I sang in Spanish. Now, uh, we take another five minute break? Yes, it did. Cameras, let's go. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to talk about rhythm for a little while and see what your own ideas are on it. Uh, I've always loved a good galloping banjo rhythm, and in recent years I've seen more and more and start off a program with... Uh, Knee. Well, he picks up a hammer and a little piece of steel. Cried, a hammer's gonna be the death of me, Lord. Hammer's gonna be the death of me, yeah. Hammer's gonna be the death of me, Lord. Hammer's gonna be the death of me. Alan used to, Alan Lomax used to describe that kind of music as a, as a. A person jumping on a horse that's already galloping. <laughs> you know, the horse is galloping along, and someone jumps on it, and 
and rides. And uh, I think in the tradition in this country, at least, uh, rhythm is tremendously important. There's a certain energy there, and uh, maybe some people in some parts of the world could sing a whole program with with uh, no strict rhythm, because some traditions don't go in for a lot of rhythm such as we know. But with a particular combination of African traditions and certain different European traditions, we've got strong rhythms in a lot of our songs. And yet I find it good to vary these rhythms. So if I've got a, a rhythm like that, I like to follow it with... And while well, sometimes you may hear again, I'm talking about continuity and variety, sometimes maybe you do want to stick with the same type of rhythm for a while. I've found it handy to, to change the rhythms. It's more important for me sometimes to, to get a certain amount of variety in rhythm than variety in key. Sometimes I'll do three, four, five songs all in the same key, but they will be in, in different rhythms perhaps. And sometimes uh, it's the relaxation you can get with a slow rhythm, which is, is very important. I think things can get too tense when you're uh, with too crisp or too fast a rhythm. At the same time as that song Down the Down showed you, uh, there's times you, you want what would be called by a musicologist an imperiodic rhythm. It's what an Irish friend of mine said, cadence. But I think it's, it's a time value which where there is no time value. Amazing Grace is one of these. Very, very slow. Amazing Grace. And the nearest thing you could think of to a rhythm would be would either be something very fast. Sometimes in church you'll see a person tapping their foot very fast during a slow song. Or but this very slow, very slow pulse, but it's not a strict rhythm. At any rate, the, the feeling for rhythm is, I think, just as important as anything else. And uh, uh, I like to fool around with counter rhythms when I can, but I'm not good enough to do it really well. Uh, sometimes in that Spanish song, I'll, when we were singing in, in uh, three, four time, I'll be play a six, eight time. But you can do this any time. Uh, with a three finger Scruggs pattern, uh, you can almost, uh, it's not a Scruggs pattern, but through three fingers, you can uh, break up a uh, simple three, three, four rhythm waltz. What one? So very uh, You could play Irene Goodnight. Uh, It's all right. Um, Papa. Many a German band has done it. But you can also. Uh, and I rather suspect that as this country absorbs more and more traditions from different parts of the world, Latin America especially. We're going to uh, experiment with more counter rhythms. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It, it can make it can make the uh, music really sparkle. Uh, I might mention too. My gosh. Banjos and guitars are only two of the instruments we can use. Uh, Bernice Regan is a wonderful song leader, and she uses a rattle, an African gourd with beads all around it. Shh, 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 shh. 
or no, or no rattle at all. She, she doesn't play any instrument except that. I've, uh, Ella Jenkins will tap on a drum, and I've known other people who'd be great song leaders just tapping on a drum. Don't have to tap on it very fancy. Any, what other instruments? What, what do you do with rhythm? Well, what I do is, um, is I make instruments. Uh, take a piece of wood and put a nail through with bottle caps and make a tambourine and, uh, and put uh, rice or beans inside uh, Clorox bottles and beer cans and it uh, doesn't cost anything. Put, put sandpaper on a block? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, lots of different things. And then hand, I hand them out and have one section be the tambourine section and one, se one uh, section be the maraca section. But I'm just handing out homemade instruments. Mm -hmm. And then do maybe Mama Don't Allow and have them, have them do the instrument sections. They really like that in particular. My mother was doing that with uh, me and other young people 60 years ago. And I did it 30 years ago when my children were small. And just recently, my wife found to sell a whole box full of these homemade these kinds of things. They <laughs> took it down to the Clearwater Club where we were having a monthly meeting on the waterfront of the Hudson, and we handed them around. Everybody had a fine time making rhythms. Hand clapping is good, too, of course. Uh, it got overdone with... And uh, so quite often I'll tell people, you know, you can clap if you want to, but don't think you can get away without singing. It's just too easy to sit back and... Mm -hmm. uh, are there are there sort of things you can do in terms of getting different rhythms going? Get people either making, you know, clapping in different kind of colors well, or Kirk, making other hand sounds. Uh, Kirk Patrick Lynn sounds. from Bessie Jones of the Sea Island Singers, you can't clap a low clap. You can't clap a high clap. She says, now everybody over here is grandpa. Here, you clap with me like this. And everybody over here, a little granddaughter. <laughs> These Georgia Sea Island singers were so phenomenal. If you've ever heard them, yeah. they're, now they're, uh, they're, old John Davis died and I, they'll never be quite the same, but there's a movie of them and you can see how they, they bang their canes against the, the floor. And so it wasn't just their feet and their hand, the canes, and all different kinds of things. The other thing, you can do is clap the air and keep talking. You can, really? I've done, done that a lot, a lot with kids. They love to hold different kind of things. You can clap and talk all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Rhythm, of course, is so important uh, that European orchestras all have leaders, and uh, if for many years it was the standard thing, if you want to be a song leader, you must know how to beat three, four times, mm -hmm, and beat four, four times, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but uh, in Samoa once I saw a song leader who, uh, well, we saw the same song done twice, and it started off with, with the song leader going into crouch. And going like this. And everybody did this. Do this. And then she went, and everybody started singing, and they sang in harmony. The missionaries came in and taught them European harmony, but they already had been singing in groups, and they loved harmony. And it's, it's uh, uh, this, and she, well, it was a 12 year old girl in the school who was giving us this welcome song, and she, uh, did almost like a hula, down on the aisle, and she would uh, uh, reach up as though she was calling on inspiration from on high. And uh, she would go like this, and everybody would clap her knee. She'd go like that, and everybody would clap the other knee. It was a very rhythmic, uh, exciting song. Then we saw the, heard the same song done that evening in a college with a young man with a more masculine version of the dance. But again, he was reaching here, and the song was a combination of dancing and singing. And uh, I, we, want, we made a movie of it, and we didn't, the film didn't come out. I'm so sorry. It's worth going. If you ever get a chance to go to, to Samoa, uh, this was Western Samoa, the New Zealand uh, protectorate, supposedly an independent country, but it's really under New Zealand's wing. 
but uh, ask to listen to that. When will any of us get to the mall? I don't know. <laughs> this is just a job in Australia, and I was able to stop off. I think maybe my question really was how can you get in, how can you get participation from an audience other than clapping or, or in or the, I mean we used to sometimes pass out things or say if it's in a restaurant oh, tap on your glass um, and this well, this kind of thing I'd heard of and I, I was sort of thinking trying to get these kids I said make I was doing a railroad song I said make whatever kind of railroad song sounds you want rhythmic vocal or whatever in it. Well, there's some special songs, you know, you can do it. Like the, the, the camp song. Let everyone clap hands like me. Let everyone clap hands like me. Come on and join into the game. You'll find that it's always the same. Let everyone stamp their feet like me. Let everyone stamp their feet like me. Come on and join into the game. You'll find that it's always the same. You sneeze, let everyone sneeze like me. They all put your mouth, hand in front of your mouth, not polite otherwise. <laughs> cough and so on. These game songs are fun, and with, I don't know, do you ever do that with senior citizens? Game songs? Mm -hmm. yeah. I've, I've done them with little kids for years. Put your finger in the air or. This old yet, man, you know actually it was San Francisco, I first heard, this old man, he plays one, he plays knick-knack knick on my thumb. thumb. And she, they had knick-knack, paddy-quack, this was on the Presidio Hill School, knick-knack, paddy-quack, all the way around, this old man sits on the ground. And they get all the kids to sit down this way. <laughs> so they'd be milling around, they want all the kids to sit down. What's the name of that movie about the Georgia Sea Islanders? Do you remember the name of it? Step It Down. Conrad. Huh? Conrad. No, no. It's called Step It Down, and it's a little half-hour movie made about eight years ago in in uh, Los Angeles, and it's available through the 16 millimeter place outfits. I don't know which one. Best was uh, uh, made it uh, was one of the people who got the funding for it. I do that uh, that dance game, which step it down with the singers, yeah. and they like that a lot. Lots of little little uh, game tricks with kids. One of the favorite ones, as you know, is. Uh, yeah. Pajamas, scratch, scratch, <laughs> and uh, then you go through all the motions. It's a cumulative thing, so it's very funny. The last times, scratch, scratch, <laughs> yum, yum, hack, hack, whoa, back, hi, baby. <laughs> I guess you can run this kind of thing in the ground, but it's good to have a certain number of these in the back of your mind in case you need them sometimes. And. Uh, one of the funniest, I, I was singing at a camp for very young children, four and five-year-olds, and their favorite song was, I stuck my finger in the woodpecker's hole, the woodpecker's hole, the woodpecker's hole. I stuck my finger in the woodpecker's hole, and the woodpecker said, remove it. <laughs> I removed my finger from the woodpecker's hole, the woodpecker's hole, the woodpecker's hole. I removed my finger from the woodpecker's hole, and the woodpecker said, Replace it. I replaced my finger in the woodpecker's hole, the woodpecker's hole. The woodpecker's hole, I replaced my finger in the woodpecker's hole. And the woodpecker said, Revolve it. I revolved my finger in the woodpecker's hole. The woodpecker's hole, the woodpecker's hole. I revolved my finger in the woodpecker's hole. And the woodpecker said, Revolve 
impressive. I immerse my finger in the woodpecker's hole, the woodpecker's hole, the woodpecker's hole. I reverse my finger in the woodpecker's hole, and the woodpecker said, Oh, ridiculous. <laughs> I really can't remember. Come on, you can. <laughs> well, all these things are full of rhythm, which means you involve your body. I think this is one reason I like to stand up myself when I sing. I can't really move my body well when I'm sitting down. Uh, as I said, Lead Belly nearly always sang sitting down. He could, he could really do what he wanted to on the guitar. Tremendously muscular man. Uh, he sometimes stood up. He had a dance, and he, it was never recorded, never filmed, but someday somebody must do it. He said, went out duck hunting, and he tells a whole story about, he used a guitar, but he, and there comes a duck, and he do a little dance, and he, there comes a And he, his body, he was a very rhythmic, muscular, graceful man, and uh, he, do some of these. Th there was one other thing he did standing up. He'd imitate uh, about five different women of Sh Shreveport, and, and he'd, he'd do a little fucking wing, double shuffle, and the old woman coming into town like this, and the little farm girl coming into town for the first time, see the sights with her eyes wide open, and all oh, the high society lady, the prostitute, the, all the different people, and he, each time he had a little buck and wing. But by and large, he sang sitting down, and he really would get a crowd singing because that big guitar had such tremendous power. And uh, whether it was bring me a little water, Sylvie, or jump down, turn around, pick a bale of cotton, or, uh, he, he did most of his singing sitting there. But I find standing better for me. I can move my body and then reach out and uh, and use my arms and everything else to, because sometimes it takes main force <laughs> uh, to keep everybody together. And one of the questions was, what do you do when you have such a huge crowd they won't stay together? There's not much you can do. I once tried to sing Senna Senna in Tel Aviv before about 20,000 people, and Senna Senna, oh, the claps came back. <laughs> It was, it was hopeless. And uh, sometimes in a very echoey auditorium, the gymnasium or something, you just cannot, a fast song won't go, so try a slow song. That's where a slow song that we shall overcome is. Right? Now, get that slow rock. Yes. So I was wondering if you have any recommendations, but rhythm is my very weak point. And um, I have a really hard time when I'm trying to get across a song to an audience, and I keep losing the rhythm. Do you have any recommendations how a person can get a better grasp on some, some of the um, more difficult rhythms? Well, I'd say play with other musicians uh, and, and practice. I do... My rhythm is bad because anybody who plays by themselves can get away with murder. You can speed up, you can slow down. <laughs> Earl Scruggs and his sister, when they were teenagers, used to play a game. They'd start playing a guitar and banjo together on the porch, and they'd walk around the house on the opposite side and meet each other, and then come around and sit down on the porch and see if they were still in rhythm when they were. Oh. were uh, <laughs> That's great. That yeah. takes some training. There were metronome books of uh, exercises to do against a metronome. Really? With the metronome that can get you tuned yeah. in. It's mechanical, but it's it's a way to get somebody to really keep making people do it. Yeah. Um, another way is to sing with the gospel choir. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> you have a standard set of songs that you do, like last night at Stanford. And I was wondering, do some of the songs just get to where they really bore you, even though they... Uh... This is a tendency, and if I don't watch out, I have, to, I have to either stop singing them for a while, or I'll sing them better. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it, if you're starting getting bored with it, other people can start getting bored with it, so it's better to stop it. Faith mentioned that, that you, it was an important point to you and some other people to rotate your songs every six yeah. months or something. Well, I find almost every year I'm doing a slightly different program. I learn a new song, and if it works, I learn. I try out new songs almost any, every month. I used to much more than I do now. I guess no, more like every three months now. And if it works, I'll sing it. Like that song I sung last night, uh, Give Me That Old Time Religion. 
somebody came, showed up to the Sloop Club and started singing it, and it was fun. You've heard it, haven't you? Mm -hmm. uh, with all the new verses to it? No. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Give me that old time We'll pray with Aphrodite. She wears that see through night, and it's good enough. We'll pray with those Egyptians, build pyramids to put our crypts in, cover subways with inscriptions, and it's good enough for me. Zarathustra, we'll pray just like we used to. I'm a Zarathustra booster, and it's good enough for me. Give me that old time religion, give me that old time religion, give me that old time religion, it's good enough for me. We will pray with those old druids, they drink the fermented fluids, waltzing naked through the woods, and it's good enough for me. Many verses you want, there's hundreds of them already. But I made up one to end off. I'll arise at early morning when my Lord gives me the warning that the solar age is dawning and that's good enough for me. It's fun to sing some new songs regularly, uh, and it, I figure if I don't enjoy it, nobody else is going to enjoy it. I suppose in, a, in the long run, this is getting down to what you're talking to, Joaquin. Uh, I, I figure if I'm enjoying myself, and if I mean what I say, uh, whether I'm serious or humorous, whatever it is, it will get across to people. And, and uh, but if I'm trying to fake it, they, it, it won't work. Uh, sincerity is a sincerity is a much overused word. Uh, sometimes uh, an old faker is sincere in his fakery. It's the way it was with vaudeville, you know. You know? They were out there giving out the hokum, but they really sincerely believed in it. <laughs> it was sincere hokum. <laughs> uh, I don't know how much we were stick. Uh, let me stick with rhythm for a moment. Uh, I think uh, one of the most fun group songs I've done in recent years is the. Uh, women's version of The Old Woman Who Swallowed a Fly. Meredith oh, yeah. Tax wrote it in Boston way back 10 or 11 years ago, and it was published in a little underground newspaper called The Old Mole, uh -huh. M-O-L-E. And uh, she had a whole page where she'd written new words to well-known melodies. And I latched on to it. I think I shortened it very slightly. Uh, but it's still a lot of fun. It has all the barbershop harmony type, type, uh, There was a young woman who swallowed a lie. I don't know why she swallowed a lie. By the time we get to the last verse, there was a young woman who swallowed a ring, looked like a princess, but felt like a thing. She swallowed a ring to make up for the pill, she swallowed the pill to follow the line, swallowed the line to follow the point, swallowed the point to follow the rule, lived to serve men, she learned it at school, she swallowed the rule to prop up the lie. But I don't know. Young 
woman, she, when one day she woke up and said, I've swallowed so much, I wish I were dead. She ran to her sisters, it wasn't too late to liberate, regurgitate. <laughs> she threw up the ring, she threw up the pill, she threw up the pill, she threw up the wine, threw up the line, she threw up the pot, threw up the pot, she threw up the rule, lived to serve men, she learned it at school, and last of all, she threw up the lie. Now she knows why she swallowed her Uh, barbershop harmony is a great thing. Uh, it uh, sure as a result an awful lot of phoniness, but uh, what, it, what we usually call barbershop was white people imitating the harmony that black people had in the barbershops way back in the 19th century. That's how James Weldon Johnson says the origin of the term. I sometimes uh, sing an old barbershop song just to remind people of how stupid the words were. With someone like you, a pal so good and true, I find you be there all the time and all the time. is what have they done to the rain while everybody was letting the rest of the world go by? <laughs> because it's very serious. This yeah. world is full of people who say, well, I can't do anything about the world, so I'm just going to get a little cozy corner for myself. You and me, baby. And, uh, and they call the social activists uh, negative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The other thing that happens is, look what they've done to my song when they take the people out. Yeah. yeah. I found myself making up a kind of barbershop harmony song, though, some years ago. And uh, it's a fun song if I say so myself. Just when I thought my mind. You gave me hope, not just the old soft song, to show that we could learn to share time. You and me and Rockefeller, I keep plugging on. Your face will shine through all our tears. Sing another little victory song. Precious friend, you will be there singing in harmony. Precious friend, you will be there. Just what I thought. Just when I thought all was lost, all, all was lost. You changed my mind. You, you changed, changed my mind. mind. Maybe hope not just the old soft soap. You gave me hope, not just the old soft song. You showed them we could learn to share in time. You and me and Rockefeller, you and me and Rockefeller. I'll keep plugging on. Your face will shine, your face will shine. Through all our tears, through all our 
Is there anything I haven't done about rhythm? Uh, sometimes, as you can see, you want a very different rhythm from others, and it's it's uh, kind of a shame not to bring out the, these different things. This is, sometimes you want a completely different type of harmony than the other, and we in this country are absorbing little bits of the traditions from all around the world, not just North Europe and South Europe and the Middle East and Africa especially, because. A tremendous amount of African music in this, is in this country. We don't know it, but it's all around us. What? That. The way we play a guitar is an African way. They don't play it. The bass is doing just like the bass drum in a West African ensemble, and the top string is getting all the syncopated notes like a little drum. And, uh, while I'm about it, I might mention that probably, I would say, the great song leaders in this country are in the black churches. These are the great song leaders in America today. A man named Carlton Reese, he uh, is now a school teacher, music teacher, in an integrated school near Birmingham, Alabama. And he's got his whole crowd of white and black kids singing with that same wonderful rock and beat. He plays a piano. And he puts a microphone to, on the left, and the piano's here, and he gets that rhythm going. The kids are moving their bodies with it, and he leads them out just like I've been. Gives them, feeds them the words. Stops playing with one hand, reaches the other, plays with the hey! <laughs> Before you know it, what was a, uh, a group of ordinary citizens, all of, was, all of a sudden is a great chorus. And it's because he's bringing African techniques uh, in here. It's one of the great things is this repeat, you know. You don't just sing, oh, when the saints go marching in. You've got, oh, when the saints, oh, when the saints go marching in, go marching in. And Tiffany is the fancy name for it. But continually reaching out for responses. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> if, uh, if you can go to some of the black churches where they're doing this and you'll you'll learn more about song leading than you can learn from me really i can show you a lot of different things but i can't show you any better things than they can show you i hope carlton reese one of these days will be better known i'm trying to i'm writing a letter to him actually have written a letter to him i haven't mailed it yet to see if maybe we could do some concerts together because i'd like to be the audiences that hear me to see how he teaches. And he does it with a, that wonderful gospel piano. So you, gosh, how do you write it down? If you roll it all, he's just covering the keys. <laughs> Big heavy set guy, uh, about 30 years old. No, no, I'm not that old. But he was, when he was a teenager, he was involved in the civil rights movement, and uh, Reverend Shuttlesworth counted on him. He said, Carlton, get this crowd together. <laughs> and Carlton would get them all together to hear Shuttlesworth give the speech. Yeah. Now, here's the interesting thing. Shuttlesworth was speaking, as I heard him two months ago in Washington, and I get, it was called Voices of the Civil Rights Movement. It was a kind of reunion of people who knew each other in the 60s. Bernice Regan brought it together, and I hope you're going to see it, because she, she took it all on videotape. And Shuttlesworth gives a wonderful talk for about half an hour, describing how Birmingham was organized, how he worked with King, and uh, how he worked on his own sometimes, how he bombed. And he was frank about his own religious feeling. He says, I'm, I believe very much in a... Uh, a God that is with me all the time. And he tells how when they tried to bomb him, his, his bed was right near the 
corner of the house and they put 12 sticks of dynamite right near the corner of the house and splinters of wood went through the wall on the other side and the bed went out from underneath him and he was unharmed. He says, I was in the lap of God. Uh, and he's a vigorous man in his 40s, I'd say. He was a young man during the civil rights movement, uh, but was uh, brave enough to speak out when no one was else speaking. I mean, he took on Bull Connor and he, and he fought him up down the line on, on legal grounds, on moral grounds, on religious grounds, and musical grounds, with Carlton there to help him. Carlton says after he finished, Reverend Shuttlesworth, you have to sing such a song. I can't remember what song. And Shuttlesworth always says, I'm, my voice is kind of hoarse today. Oh, you have to sing it. Shuttlesworth sang beautifully. What a beautiful voice. But not only that, Carlton reaches out and he gets the whole crowd singing along with Shuttlesworth. So Shuttlesworth is just giving the lines, and they're coming in with the responses. And just like the ocean supporting a boat, they were supporting him. And he was singing better and better as it went on. And uh, I hope to live to see the day when in Congress, the congressman, a congresswoman from Alabama or Georgia will stand up and give all the legal reasons why they're in favor of a certain bill and all the moral and, and sentimental reasons why they're in favor of a bill and then they're going to break into song and all the other southern uh, <laughs> congressmen are going to suddenly join in and the person taking notes is going to say, how do I write this down? <laughs> because music and, and, and prose just blend it so beautifully. I mean, the prose becomes more and more rhythmic and uh, more and more poetic, and the repetition comes in. The repetition is tremendously important. Uh, and uh, it gets to where a song has meaning that you can't put in words. Uh, I know in some traditions they say in the beginning was the word, but in other traditions in the beginning was the beat. And maybe that's where I should end this little chapter. <laughs> So we'll take another five minute break and we have one more session. Okay? We have enough for one more session? Yeah. Okay? <laughs> Locking and rolling. You're on. In the few minutes we have left, I'll try to specifically answer some of the questions that. Uh, in these few minutes, uh, Lord knows I'm sure I've forgotten to say a lot of things. Uh, I feel like I'm like an old baseball pitcher. It's got a lot of tricks up his sleeve, and it's handy to know them all. Learning how to use microphones, learning how to tune an instrument quickly, uh, having a lot of different songs in the back of your head, so you can handle different situations because no two audiences are alike. And uh, you and I, we're not like a performer that hasn't a so-called act. We come out and do the same thing over and over again. We're changing always. We want to meet our people halfway. Here's a bunch of human beings. Uh, if we are fortunate, the human race survives. 50,000 years from now, there'll be human beings on this earth, and they'll be their ancestors, and we're their ancestors. Uh, and these, those people 50,000 years ago will be all our great-great-great-great-grandchildren walking around. So these people out here who I probably disagree with in many things, and they disagree with me about many things, I've got to find some way to get together with them. I'll try and reach them halfway. I'll sing some songs that they really want to sing, although they may not be my favorites. Uh, but then having done that, I'll sing them some songs which are my favorites and let them, let them uh, listen to them. Uh, and it's this give and take which I think civilization is all about. Uh, I can't tell you all the different things. Uh, I've tried to tell you something about harmony, rhythm. Uh, but don't worry about too much theory. Just get out and do it and try it. And you'll work out your own theories as you... Uh, but pour everything you've got into it. You know, Jimmy Durante, when he went out on stage, he said, I get them all! Give them all I got! <laughs> and that's what we got to do too. Give them all you got. Whether you're 
a soft, quiet voice person or a shout or whatever it is, you still have to give them all your God. And Faith, you were saying something. Something about sharing a song? Well, yes, there's a difference of there's a difference between performing a song and sharing a song. I'm sure the audience knows what you're doing and responds to what you're doing there very much. I, I to me, I, I feel like I'm communicating with them all the time. They're giving a lot to me, and I'm well. I, I'm yeah. a preacher. I, I'm like you. I do a lot of songs, and then I do the ones I want to do too. Just make my point. Well, we have a we have a tremendous and important job in front of us, all of us, and uh, we can all learn from each other. I have never actually heard you lead a song. I'm going to have to come around. <laughs> uh, I tried to talk about the advantages of keeping going and and. And sticking with the song at the other times. Sometimes I've stopped right midstream. I sung two verses and said, This isn't the right song. I've quit and go on something else. Uh, somebody asked a question. Uh, are there times when it's better not to play an instrument while leading songs? I wrote down yes when you're not good at it. <laughs> uh, have you found it better to teach a chorus to an audience by singing through it slowly a couple times or speaking through it and then going into song? I don't find this so helpful. I find better to do it as well as I can up to tempo. Then later on, maybe I can do it slowly. Way with the Spanish song. I sang it up to tempo first, and then later on, I have to slow down a little because it's too difficult to, to sing it up to tempo. And sometimes, as I did with that Malvina's song, Sing Along, I speak the words out to make sure everybody gets them clear. It's, they say it's important to have relative, perfect pitch. I don't have perfect pitch, I've got a relative pitch, but I don't, I can't tell you whether I'm singing a C or a C sharp or a D or, I, uh, but I can, got fairly good relative pitch. Keeping a steady beat, I guess this is good if you've got a song that needs a steady beat. Oh, what do you do if there's no sound system? Have you ever, any of you ever tried speaking to the people within earshot and saying, look, you're my, you're my uh, loudspeaker. We'll start a song and if those few who can hear me sing it out, those who can't hear me will get it from you. Occasionally mics have just conked out on me. So I've shouted, Everybody within your earshot, here we go, and I sing, start off with a song that they know well enough so they can pick it up for me, and then they sing it loud enough, and pretty soon a thousand people or two thousand people are getting it from them. Uh, I learned that trick from, of all things, a Chinese. Liu Yang Mo came over here in World War II uh, teaching some of the songs he, uh, which he was teaching to the Chinese communist armies. He said, we don't have microphones over there, but I get a group of singers the day before and I teach them the song and they're my microphone, loudspeakers. And next thing you know, they were teaching a song to 5,000 people. <laughs> he was a YMCA song leader, incidentally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, what do you do with rock and roll addicts? <laughs> Sing a rock and roll song. <laughs> Sing something they know. Don't at least meet meet them halfway. Uh, what do you have when you have a, a very formal setting or with ill or non mobile people? This happens in hospitals. I've sung. You do your best. You can't it, it doesn't work out as well, but uh, some, it's a lot better than it would be if you weren't there. I remember singing in the hospital. I was, that was my job, singing in the hospitals when I was overseas in the island of Saipan. And I remember a ward full of men in casts, and I didn't even know if they could hear me, except one guy's toe was wiggling outside the cast. It was all, you could hardly see the guys wrapped up in bandages. So if you have, it's true, formal settings don't help. If I had my favorite, I don't know how about you, but if I had my favorite way to make music, it would be in a very crowded room. Because when human bodies are crowded close, they, uh, you get the critical mass going. And uh, maximum maybe a few hundred. 
And then, by gosh, we raise the roof, and everybody's with it. Uh, I suppose it's nice if they can see you, uh, because they can follow your lips. And uh, I sang that old, slow English love song, The Water is Wide, for a group in this Sanders Theater, 800 people. And I was amazed how well they kept with me, because I got so interested in singing it that I wasn't using my hand, but they were just following my lips. Just following my lips. And, and they kept rhythm beautifully. So they, it's a remarkable what they can do if they want to. Uh, but I don't know what else I can tell you that I haven't already. What about that story with the lumberjacks? Uh, the oh, person? yeah. Woody Guthrie and I were told by the... Irene Wall arranged this. Uh, she introduced us to the Lumber Workers Union shop steward, organizer. He said, well, I'm going out to visit several camps uh, tomorrow. Uh, why don't you come with me? Uh, and you can sing some songs for the men. He says, they're all Scandahoovians. Don't expect them to make a big fuss over you. They're the taciturn type. Well, he, that was an understatement. <laughs> he, uh, the bunkhouse, about 50 feet square, about 80 men sitting around in their bunks. And he stood near the stove in the center and made a report on the union uh, negotiations. He said, but how many couple of men here are going to sing you some songs? And, uh, there was dead silence. We stood up and we sang a song. There was dead silence. We sang another song. Dead silence. We said, well, let's sing one more and call it an evening. We sang one more and there was dead silence. We said, thanks. Then we walked to the door. One of them said, aren't you going to sing any more? Well, we went, you want to hear one? Yeah. We went back, sang another song, dead silence. <laughs> And so, thanks a lot, men. And we walked off. Next morning, breakfast, one of the men said, Oh, that music was wonderful. We could have listened to it all night. Well, <laughs> 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 the Scandian Scandinavians are taciturn. <laughs> I was wondering how, if you have any special things that you do to get ready to do a big performance, you know, like tonight. Breathe deeply. <laughs> Love a few uh, deep knee bends or touch toes. Your physical health is tremendously important. And if your back is giving you trouble, tighten up your stomach muscles. That's why you get your backs. It gets in trouble when you don't have strong enough stomach muscles. And. Uh, uh, it was W.E.B. Du Bois said that uh, disregarding your health is a political error. Uh, God gave us a certain amount of strength, but we can lose it easily if we don't get exercise and eat properly and sleep properly and so on. And uh, when I, I'm uh, in a bad way, I can't do a good job in the audience. If I horse, I can still do it if my muscles are feeling strong. My, I can be quite hoarse and still do a fairly good job of song reading. Yeah. But if I'm tired, been without sleep for a couple of nights, um, I'm, I'm going to louse it up. I, uh, the way you and Faith introduce songs makes, I feel, and uh, somebody else said, makes people feel like they're, you're singing about their relatives. A lot of us don't do that. Can you speak to that? I mean, how you talk about songs that, that just make everybody feel like they're singing about a friend and what's just to really sing out. I never heard that said, but I guess it's true. I'd, I'd like to think that every song is, it becomes personally important to everybody who hears it. Uh, and so I guess you just want to do it. That must come through. Uh, I've, I used to talk too damn much, and I've tried to cut down on the talking in recent years. The reason was, once, years ago, somebody asked me to do some lectures, and I had so much fun lecturing after <laughs> I, I, for it took me years to get over it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> then I listened to some of the best singers and song leaders I know, and I realized they don't talk half as much as I do. They make the words count. Now, if you're really good at talking as Woody Guthrie is, you can, well, you can talk all evening, no one care. <laughs> Oh, 
I'll sing you a song maybe you don't know. Jim Garland wrote it, the man who wrote The Death of Harry Sims, the man who wrote I Don't Want Your Millions, Mister. It's a radical song. He was a radical. He was a coal miner. His father had been an organizer for the Knights of Labor in the 1880s. And in the 1930s, early 30s, down from the north come some radicals who says, the reason you coal miners are poor is because the people that own the coal miners, coal mines are rich. Well, Jim says, I know that. Said, well, we got a whole theory about it. We call it communism. And, uh, and Jim uh, started studying this and he made up a song. How well I do remember how class struggle brought me through. <clears throat> I went out on strike in 32 And they brought the thugs against me And the state militia too And they kicked me in the gutter How about you? How about you? How about you? Can't you see this system's rotten through and through? It gives millions to the bosses, the capitalistic few, but enslaves the toiling masses like me and you. Now, the song was never widely sung, Jim never got. Uh, another good verse is that first verse, and I tried and never succeeded, but that's a good verse and a good chorus anyway. How about you? How about you? Can't you see the system run through and through? It gives billions to the bosses. Capitalistic view, but enslaves the toiling masses like me and you. It's an old church hymn, you know. Jim didn't write the melodies like Woody Guffey. He got a good melody, put new words to it. I sometimes think a melody is like a well-constructed building. Many people can live in it through the generations. It can be used as a dwelling, a house, a workshop. So the same tune has been used for a ballad, or a church song, or a work song, or here a union song, or a revolutionary song. How well I do remember how class struggle brought me through. I went out on strike in 32, and they brought the thugs against me, and the state militia too. And they kicked me in the gutter. How about you? Sing it now. How about you? How about you? Can't you see the system running through and through? It gives millions to the bosses, the capitalistic view. But enslaves all willing masters like me and you. Well, I don't know if I shocked you singing an old revolutionary song like that, but you know, it, it's all our heritage. We can use what we want of it. And uh, I mistrust words more now than I ever did in my life. I mistrust them whether they're used by Christians or communists or Muslims or anybody else. I think there's a lingocentric predicament that every word user is in. You've heard of the ethnocentric predicament? We can't really understand another's culture because we're looking through the screen of our own culture. Similarly, every one of us who uses words is probably only being partly understood by someone else. Now, maybe this is true of music, too. Maybe our music means different things. But one reason I'm a musician is that I'm more conscious than ever of the inadequacies of words. Words help, and a few words introducing a song can help.
tell people. I tell people about who wrote Amazing Grace. It was a sea captain. He was carrying slaves from Africa. And his conscience got to him. And he became a preacher and wrote the song Amazing Grace. I tell the song, the story about the man who wrote he was a textile worker running for his life because he'd been elected mayor of Paris during the Paris Commune, mayor of his district of Paris. And this Paris Commune was falling and the leaders were being executed the minute they were captured and he was in hiding. He writes six long verses calling on all the oppressed people of the world to overthrow their masters. He assumed they knew French. <laughs> well, words I think are useful, but let's recognize their limitations. And I would like to end this little session by repeating use harmony, use melody, use melody. Gosh, what beautiful melodies we've got. There's been handed us on a silver platter. My young love came to me. She moved through the fair so softly she wandered both here and there and she laid her hand on me and she did say it will not be long, long till our wedding Someday, people like you are going to make that song as well known to 300 million Americans as it is now known to a few lovers of Irish song. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I wish I could stick around longer, but I got a concert this evening. I'm going to hit the sack. And uh, I also wish I lived in, in uh, San Francisco more so I could see more of what the San Francisco folk music club is doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really I hope that you can broaden the definition of folk music. Uh, people get the idea that folk music is guitars and banjos, and, and uh, you say, well, that's not a folk song, that's an Italian song. <laughs> that's not a folk song, that's a, that's a Cuban song. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, more accordions. Yeah, it tends to be a limiting term you know, rather yeah. than an expansive <laughs> If anybody ever does get a chance to go to Samoa, learn that well. <laughs> because we mucked it. We, we lost it. It didn't come out. But I'll never forget the whole crowd was like this. And then she went, everybody clapped their hands and they started singing in three, four part harmony. It was magnificent. And they just, she did this hula up and down the aisle. Is there anything we can do for you in return, any of us at all? Just keep on singing. <laughs> oh, well, you know what you all.